thanks. Um, so this is um, Students for Direct Action Food Co-op Committee uh, that I'm talking to um, that and, and the um, out of uh, the students, part of it is University of Calgary, right? Um, and um, so I'm speaking with Isabel Michaela Mateusz. Um, my name is Elliot Bridgewater. Uh, I'm a uh, cooperative lawyer uh, and social enterprise lawyer based out of Calgary, Alberta. Well, Water Valley, I guess more specifically, an hour outside of Calgary. Um, and I'm really interested in talking to um, cooperative leaders and um, up and coming uh, future co-op leaders on on essentially what uh, what cooperativism is and what is its relevance for the 21st century, um, if we can break it down. Um, and uh, so you, Isabel, approached me, I don't know how long ago, um, let's say eight months to a year ago, um, asking about, you know, what, you know, we want, we're really interested in starting a food co-op, kind of, how do we do it? What, what's, <laughs> what's the deal? Um, and uh, since then, we've started working together a lot more, and, and we both learned a lot and, and made a lot of connections along the way. Um, and but you've you've uh, I'm not sure exactly what's gone on with the food co-op so far. So could you uh, all three of you perhaps uh, kind of fill me in on what's what's going on, why you were interested in food co-ops, and what you've learned so far? Yeah. So uh, we uh, we began the conversation with each other and. Um, uh, work to bring other people on board on the idea of a food cooperative because um, and this is common across like other many other uh, Canadian post-secondaries um, there's a huge problem of food insecurity on campuses and in our case um, what we know is that um, it's been a long-standing issue of uh, our university being effectively a food desert due to the high cost of meals on campus um, and students in that regard being uh, captive consumers and then there being um, a lack of culturally appropriate, healthy, sometimes vegetarian, especially halal kosher meals um, and availability. And so uh, all of it just contributes to, um, and like we, we, we think of uh, all the other issues that post-secondary students deal with as interconnected. So this has huge impacts on mental health, barriers to affordability of education, and that sort of thing. And um, we, we were looking at the food cooperative model because we were thinking, you know, how can we how can we build a solution to these issues that is democratic and participatory and isn't just a handout service model um, where people are alienated from the solution? You know, we want people to have some sovereignty and control over their situation. And the cooperative model kind of does that. It's also a really good uh, model to build a democratic culture on a campus um, and we really want to foster that. So, yeah. yeah something else too is that the post-secondary learning act and it's pretty similar across other provinces is it has this space where unions can levy independent fees so union like membership fees could be collected through the union and uh, and every student could automatically become a part of the cooperative and it's a really cool way for unions to and students themselves to kind of take control of our situations and provide services for each other uh, in a way that kind of doesn't really exist in other spaces. Oh, very cool so where are you at? Um, so I think there's uh, obviously some really key tie-ins with the cooperative movement. Uh, Mateusz you, you mentioned uh, um, De democratic culture, democratic accountability and enterprise, um, and, uh, and, and, and implied uh, I'm kind of an enterprise element of this where it was, um, you know, not necessarily a handout, I think he said, um, but, but people were engaged in, in this uh, enterprise and democratic way. So I, I, I really appreciate that comment. Um, and Isabel, you're mentioning more kind of the solidarity and, and how it ties into community culture, uh, student culture. Um, so, so what have you, I guess, what kind of challenges have you met along the way? I mean, we're kind of really in the journey here. Um, you're, uh, but kind of, if you could ex kind of explain kind of what, what obstacles you faced and kind of where maybe you're at in the, in the process. I know we're, we've talked about kind of incorporation, but, um, you know, co-op development is so much about values and, and creativity first, 
um, and identifying, for instance, membership and identifying um, some, some objectives for what is the specific service we're providing uh, to members and how members are going to be benefit. How do we're going to define, for instance, patronage? Uh, what is the world's responsibilities of members? Are they, how are they contributing and what entitlements are they getting? So have you, um, could you just kind of explain where you're at with, with, with all those kind of issues? So currently we're, we're facing kind of internal challenges and external challenges. And so the internal challenges are probably things that would look very similar to any other cooperative that's trying to start up, especially people who maybe are coming into this with like only um, a certain level of knowledge base where we, there's a need for a lot of like reaching out to other people to fill certain roles in the exercise to like figure out what we need in terms of like developing a budget, developing a business plan. What does incorporation look like? How do we develop bylaws and what do we want those bylaws to say? Mm -hmm. So there's all of those challenges, which we're very eager to work on, but there's just this, there's, there's no lack of eagerness in our community, but there is a lack of, um, I think, confidence in ensuring because we we really want to do this well and we want to make sure that we do it right but we know that none of us have started a co-op before so i think we at this stage in terms of like the broader question you asked like we're really starting to reach out to other community members both on campus and off campus to like develop extra resources develop knowledge like you 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 yourself are one of those resources that we've reached out to we've reached out to um, other food co-ops in Calgary, um, like Growers YYC and the Allium, and we're reaching out to different students on campus to try and increase our capacity to do some of those things on our own, because the goal ultimately is for this to be a student-run initiative, and so as much as we value the outside resources and knowledge, we do want to be able to do a lot of these things ourselves and carry it on through it, so I think right now our biggest struggle is trying to find all of the pieces that we need and find all of the people to put all those pieces together in a way that we are able to create the thing that we're trying to create. Uh, just on the like external challenges uh, bit is, you know, um, what, one, of the, one of the basic problems is that uh, like, we have to make the case to the student body and to really the student union um, that, that this is a worthwhile venture. And so, you know, that ties into the internal problems. We have to have everything organized and presentable. Um, but the other, the other thing is that uh, we don't have large scale and regular data collection on food insecurity yet. Um, and so that, that's, that's one of the issues that we were trying to solve by launching our food co-op survey. Um, in it, we, we tried to collect information on food insecurity and also ask the question, you know, what would you want to see in a food co-op? So um, from a business perspective, I suppose that part is market research, but it's also a genuine attempt to understand, you know, the needs of that community, um, like just of the students. Um, and then uh, the, the other aspect is a bit of policy wonkery with, with the students union and, you know, can students union levy fees for quote unquote third parties? Um, and the answer is yes, um, uh, but you know it that that in itself took a lot of resources and research to go like talk to the policy analysts, um, review the legislation, talk to other students' unions, come up with counterexamples, um, and that sort of thing. So um, that, that that's sort of the external bit, and then of course there's the natural: is there a robust funding environment for our work? Um, the fact is that you know students are already overworked and underpaid in the regular job life and you know we're we're seeking out students to to you know join and increase our, our capacity and then at the same time you know the students are dealing uh, are, are being overworked in the work environment in the school environment and then in a pandemic environment so you know um that the, 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 i think that that contributes to the external challenges um, if I could just add one other thing in terms of external challenges, there's also on almost every single level of the problem that we're trying to solve and the solution that we're developing is a complete lack of understanding. So campus, both the university and the community and students, 
don't really understand what food security looks like on campus, partially because of the lack of data that's been collected. And then also there is this real lack of understanding of what a cooperative is and what that could mean on campus. So in the survey that Matuj mentioned, we asked the question about what the student body felt about the idea of a food co-op. And some people were very interested in it, but some of the very um, memorable comments that we got were people really misunderstanding what we were trying to do. They really saw it as like, when you talk about food security in a food initiative, their mind instantly goes to like a food bank where it's not a process that is based in student engagement and community and a democratic enterprise. So one of our challenges, and I think this will probably be a challenge forever potentially is ensuring that the community members that we're trying to engage with understand the problem of food security on campus, what it looks like, who's affected by it, understand what cooperatives are and what they can do for students on campus and like what that really looks like because people really don't know. And that is definitely become a challenge when reaching out to people is baseline having to explain what a cooperative is before we can even start having a conversation of what one might look like on campus. And another piece to that too is that our university, unlike a lot of other campuses, we don't have kind of a history of solidarity organizing. We don't really have a history of really strong wins that the students have achieved. Um, and I personally have been on campuses where that's not the case, where the students know their power and we know um, when we work hard, we can win. And uh, I think that that students really haven't felt that, that win and that power on our campus before. And we're hoping that this will be something that the students can fight for that will in, you know, increase our levels of food security and increase our levels of uh, you know, solidarity, solidarity with each other and, and relationships with each other in a positive way. And that can feel like a win. And then we can you know, fight for bigger and better things as well. It's it's interesting the 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 tw the kind of twin challenge, uh, Michaela, that you mentioned between um, not knowing what a co-op is and not knowing what food security means or, or can look like. Um, and you know, just as an entry point into it, you mentioned um, food banks, and you know what's interesting is that you could actually do a cooperative food bank, uh, and you could do a mixed a mix of uh, food bank esque. Uh, programs with different programs, depending on, you know, barriers to access for members uh, and different stakeholder groups you may have as members. Um, so it's it's definitely, you could definitely explain it in the ways like, okay, well, yeah, it could be like a food bank, if, if that's where, where our journey takes us, could be like a food bank, if that's what food security, if that's what we find out it looks like, and that's what the real need is for members. Um, but it's like a food bank that you own. Uh, and you own and we own it together. Uh, and the most important principle in that ownership is that we own it democratically, uh, according to the principle of one member, one vote. So uh, we make decisions together, uh, democratically. Um, and, and that can look, a, you know, you can get into the you can and we will get into the fine print of that at some point. But, uh, but from a, you know, 30,000 feet, looking outwards, you know, that's, that's, a, that's an entry point into the conversation and so, say, yeah, you know, if there's real need, then, then we can form this in ways that it looks, uh, looks a lot like uh, institutions you've seen, but the, but, but the really great thing is that um, you don't control any of those institutions, whereas this one, you really have, you do have a say, um, and you have um, a stake, a real stake in it uh, as part of the, uh, as part of the capital, part of the, the money, the foundation of, of that. Um, and so it, it, you, you're not just a passive recipient, um, you are um, part of the uh, proactive solution. Uh, you're engaged on both sides. Um, and that is incredibly empowering, it can be. Um, and that is what I would say is, the, is, is uh, true cooperativism and kind of direct democracy that, uh, that when it's done well and it's not without its own, with, without its challenges, but, uh, but that's what uh, cooperatives can achieve and have achieved and there's and there's several precedents um, throughout Canada but especially in the U.S. of uh, campus food co-ops that have succeeded and they become much more um, than um, um, than just providing food or grocery services for instance um, but actually being highly involved in uh, volunteerism in community events in community organizing in education 
not just cooperative education, but you know, health and well-being education uh, more broadly. So it can become a hub uh, of sorts. And obviously a lot of the private sectors emulated the, this after the fact because cooperatives have been, you know, we're part of the natural food movement or, or pretty much kicked it off in the 60s and 70s. And, and you see how that's been kind of co-opted by uh, grocery chains and for better or worse, I mean, sometimes a little better, but you know, all, always in the gray area of trying to maximize <laughs> their profits. Um, which is not what cooperativism is about. So the other way to explain it is, look, at we're not in it to make a whole bunch of money. We're in it to provide a quality service, first and form foremost to members, to the benefit of members. And then if we make a profit, guess where it goes? It goes back to members according to how much they use the co-op. Um, so, but that being said, you can have a for-profit and non-profit co-op. Um, so, you know, that's a decision that, uh, that, that uh, you'll need to make at some point um, as, um, as a steering committee, probably before you incorporate, but hopefully with some with some people at the table, stakeholders at the table, where you can get really and and the more the merrier, I I would say. Before you incorporate, but anyways, that's a, that's a lot. Um, so Isabel, do you have any any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, those are the conversations that's that right. we're having now is kind of how to make sure <clears throat> that the decisions we're making are reflective of the needs of students. Um, and the most the students who are going to be most at need of food are going to be the least likely to have you know time and energy to give us um and yeah that's something we're working on now we're thinking about um kind of institutionalizing relationships with uh like stakeholder student groups or um, formalizing accountability measures and things like that and yeah i don't know if anyone else has anything to add on that I, I wanted to make a comment on like um, food stigma or, or, or stigma when it comes to like accessing um, help, uh, like uh, help with food, uh, specifically like there's a stigma when you want to, when you consider going to the food bank and it's often a deterrent, like the statistics are that a very, very small number of, of people who, people, students, all populations who are food insecure actually go and access the food banks um and a big part of it like they try to account for whether it's a lack of knowledge of that resource but often it's the case that stigma plays a huge role um and a misunderstanding of the service and i think that when you put actual democratic control in people's hands it's it creates a dignity that i think um overrides that stigma and so like even if it, like in the scenario that there's a food bank that is cooperativized, I think it can go from that. Um, it can go from a, a well-meaning charity that that still uh, has stigma to, oh, this thing isn't separate from me. You know, just here, uh, um, impersonal person. Uh, now, now go and um, feed yourself for for a week, hopefully. Um, maybe save save a buck or two it becomes like oh this is a community resource that's always there you know I've always contributed to it as a member um, and it's my inherent and dignified right to, to food um, so I think co-ops um, can also can also flip the lack of dignity on its head I absolutely agree Matush that that's that's an that's an exceptional point um, and you can look at like you know even the concept of a bank um, you know, if we take that concept of a bank and we turn it into the concept of a credit union, which is just a cooperatively organized financial institution that you know, provides banking services, um, and those, and, and you look at the foundation, the history of those, and that is because, you know, farmers, <clears throat> people of, people of, of uh, lesser means or, or scarcity of means uh, raised those scarce resources together. Uh, in order to provide themselves insurance and provide themselves with a safety net um, and uh, and be able to get credit, right? To be able, because that wasn't on offer. Um, so, and that was incredibly empowering to these communities over time. Credit unions are are in most, if not all, small towns of any uh, of any size uh, across Western Canada, and it's a well known. Um, resource for people and well respected and appreciated by by special especially personal banking um so so that it's kind of an interesting tie in there when we think of you know well, a food bank has the stigma attached 
and 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 it's just you you, you go there when you're at rock bottom and you know it just confirms that oh man i'm like i'm so down on my luck that i have to go and get whatever they're going to give me at the food bank um as opposed to no this is a foundation from which we build solidarity and security um and safety in our communities uh and we all contribute and participate in this and and when we need uh, when we need food, the most primary resource in our lives, we know where we can go and get it. And so we can take um, different kinds of, we can participate in community in a different, more healthy way. And we don't have to be, um, you know, indentured labor through uh, various, you know, low end jobs. We can, so I think that can be empowering and, and actually liberating is what I'm saying. And so, yeah, I think that that is, that is a very strong, strong point um, to get across as, as you grow this. I just wanted to kind of add on to that point. I think one of the things about cooperatives compared to food banks is it's so well suited towards the the student psychology, I think. So we know that um, food insecurity amongst post-secondary students is much higher than that of the general population, but when they go to food banks less. They use food security sources and resources less than the general population does. And part of the reason that we understand it and it's not entirely that but there's some knowledge going around that says is that basically like there is this expectation that as a student you're supposed to be broke and you're supposed to eat like crap all the time you're supposed to eat um like ramen noodles every day you're supposed to eat a bunch of junk food that's the expectation so a student who maybe suddenly is like oh wow i don't have any food to eat for the rest of the week is presented, maybe they are, they're aware of a food bank on campus, but they would say, oh, that's not for me. I'm a student. I'm supposed to be kind of hungry. I'll just like, I don't know, buy snacks from a vending machine or bum $5 off my friend to go like eat lunch from Tim Hortons or whatever it is. Whereas if there's an organization on campus that basically functions as something that's accessible to everyone, regardless of their personal circumstances in terms of food security, it kind of reduces the stigma even internally. So there isn't this, oh shoot, I can't eat anything. I need to go to the, the food co-op. It's, oh, I'm hungry. And the food co-op will give me a meal for $2.50 or whatever it is. And so it's just kind of this ease in which students can be involved with something so that they don't even have to like wrap their cell wrap their brain around the fact that they're food insecure in a way that really isn't acceptable but society has kind of deemed it acceptable yeah, like students are kind of expected this is something that you're supposed to experience is this kind of hunger and i think as students we need to recognize that we can help each other and we don't have to like experience post-secondary education like this the other thing is that Students for Direct Action has like a, a mutual aid focus. And I think that co-ops um, respond uh, in a similar way where we're not putting barriers to access in front of accessing food. You don't have to be a certain level of financial insecure to access the food co-op in, in a way that I think a lot of more, you know, traditional charities will put, you know, you have to experience this level of poverty, you have to have this amount of money in your bank account. And we're kind of saying, no, like everybody deserves access to food and we're not here to police who, uh, who needs to eat today. So what do you see as the next steps? Um, what, do you, what, do you, what issues do you think you need to drill down and, def and start defining? Um, our next steps are, yeah, kind of digging into this mutual aid piece responding to food insecurity on campus primarily, like as our primary goal, like we wanna make sure students are eating. Uh, we're hoping to secure some funding to kind of, yeah, just like hand out food on campus, like just give it out for free. People who need it can take it. Um, and as we do that, we can, you know, connect with the people who are in need. We can connect with people who are interested in helping out, um, build knowledge around the co-op on campus and yeah, and then like get people into the committee and hopefully we're aiming to incorporate around uh, like late fall sometime. And yeah, we've been having early conversations about our bylaws and fee structure and all of that. So it's been good. I also think um, um, 
some of the next steps are like when 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 building that structure, bringing on um, business students, which we which we've had some success in, <laughs> um, bringing on business students uh, to to and this is part of the whole conversation about increasing our capacity is um, business students to help put together uh, a business plan. Um, you know, just in in terms of the conversations that have been had. Um, in terms of concretely the vision of the food co-op, like the conversations have been a multi-stakeholder food cooperative um, kind of modeled off of uh, the Hive Cafe at Concordia University with um, most seats being uh, reserved for students, one seat for the students union, and then the second largest category of seats, uh, board seats uh, reserved for um, the employees of the cooperative, the employee owners. Um, and uh, at the same time, in terms of uh, uh, discussion of, you know, um, like it, it, in, in the conversation, it has been with a fee levy, a for-profit food cooperative can have the flexibility to provide food at a lower cost. And at the same time, any profits could be, and again, it depends on what the board would like to do, could, for example, like this is where our imagination takes us. It could partner with our Students' Union Food Bank and expand the Students' Union Food Bank's um, free, free breakfast program into an everyday hot free meal program, um, things like that. And a lot of this comes down to resources. Um, and in terms of what our interim survey results say, in terms of what students uh, would like to see, there's a huge case to be made for shawarma on campus. Um, and in fact, the, like the, that particular type of food has been talked about uh, uh, like uh, th there being a need for that type of food on campus for a while. So um, uh, again, like these are these are very preliminary discussions, but we need the assistance of business students and um, cooperative veterans and um, student stakeholders to come together to kind of flesh out the specifics of that vision. And if that vision is even tenable, maybe we might have to pivot to something else. Um, and also Michaela has been doing a lot of work on uh, food and security research. So I'll, I'll pass the baton. Yeah, so I mean, we ran a, a small survey in the spring to kind of gauge the level of food insecurity on campus and to kind of reach out to the student body and see if they what they felt the need was in terms of food security, what food initiatives were. And we got a, a certain level of response, but this fall there is going to be hopefully a much larger, larger excuse me, survey being run on campus to understand food insecurity. It's being done simultaneously to um, similar surveys on many other university campuses across the country to kind of get this kind of nationwide understanding of food insecurity. And what we are also hoping to do in this early fall, especially, is to reach out to different student populations to have conversations about food on campus, about their experiences with food, what they feel they need, what they have. And I think that that is going to be really valuable. One of the things we hope to do is reach out to certain notable clubs and student organizations, because I don't think we've actually mentioned this, but one of the issues that is a challenge to developing a cooperative on a university campus is that the population is transitory. So in terms of defining membership and considering how that gonna work, like at most people are students on campus, you know, five, six years, but a lot of them are on campus for a lot less time. So if we are able to kind of develop relations with the students union, with um, notable clubs and organizations on campus that are representative of populations that care about food insecurity and are maybe populations that deal with greater levels of food insecurity, then that would allow us to kind of ensure that we're able to carry on long after we've all graduated because that's the goal like all of us are going to leave the university of calgary at some point in time but we want the co-op to be still be there and so we need to if anything make sure that in this next year or so really is really dig down and develop the roots so that we understand what's happening on campus understand what students want and need and what they're looking for and understand that like we are an organization that they can come to us to to have these conversations so that if there are people who want to do something around food on campus, they can reach out to us. If they're a person who's individually dealing with food insecurity, they can come to us. And we want to kind of reduce that stigma that seems to be happening and this disconnect and this isolation that's kind of 
especially in this past year and a half, been very present on university campuses. So it's really about community and relationship building for the next year to really get the co-op to be where it needs to be. I know I always have a need for uh, shawarma. So Matej, I, 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 uh, I think you're on the right track there from my, my vantage point. Um, uh, yeah, there's always a need to, to grow community um, uh, and, and engage potential members. And so I think, I, you know, I, I would suggest that you're in a place where you're still defining what the service is to members and that's, gonna, that's going to inform your definition of membership and the contribution members uh, will provide um, and what they will get out of it, right? That's, they're all linked together. Um, and so I would focus on that because that's really, you know, we talk about the cart before the horse, the, the horse is the service, is the need that's being addressed. And we don't know what the need is, then, you know, we can experiment that, we can try things, try things out, um, but you need to kind of, I think, start uh, doing a thing to it, or at least what you think it, uh, to address the, the, the need. Um, so I think that can be a really creative space, whether it's shawarma, uh, or it's groceries, or it's uh, or it's food services at two fifty two dollars and fifty cents. How can we provide that? You know, are people willing to? And you don't need a co op to do that um, per se, or you don't need to incorporate a co op to do that uh, to start that out. Because you know, many many campus um, food co ops, um, but also other co ops started off as buying clubs, right? Well, we're going to go bulk buy, and actually, mo a lot of co ops in general, grocery co ops and uh, food co ops start off that way, right? Is that uh, we want a thing to provide, you know, the middleman is, is charging too much or they're not providing this. And so we're gonna go and get it for ourselves and we're gonna leverage our, our scarce resources, but together and, and buy this at a, at a lower cost than we could buy it ourselves and in a way that's coordinated rather than you know, atomized and isolated um, so that we can keep it consistent and we can we can make sure that we have it as, as members need it. Um, more or less so so that's kind of you know that, that that can be a creative process too it's kind of like how do we how do we start this like find somebody that's just kind of get the ball rolling because i mean i think approaching business students and other students is going to be important too and getting a business plan is important but you also have to experience the co-op model um and business students have to know the co-op model just as you will have to know it right so you really have to and, and and I'm you know I, I say that because I've I've I'm in my experience more and more I'm talking to co-ops that have sometimes been around for decades, and have forgotten the co-op principles. Um, and those co-op principles are enshrined in law, um, but they're also at the very foundation of why we're doing what we're doing as a de democratic enterprise. Otherwise, there's no point in all of this uh, challenge of bringing everybody together to make decisions together. Um, but the co-op model is really a principled model um, <clears throat> at its core. Uh, and that's why it has the restrictions it does. Um, and, and so the business plan has to, I would say, address those seven cooperative principles. Um, and, and, and that may be something that uh, that business plan may change as you, as you experiment. So I, I, would, I would encourage you to, to, to take risks as much as you can. Um, to, to try to start a thing, uh, um, whatever you think that initiative is, and then and, and get students together around it and start making those decisions democratically. Um, and, and we can always incorporate, um, you know, but the risk is too of incorporating too soon. And then you've got this, you've got this legal infrastructure that you're, you're trying to parse at the same time you're trying to, you know, drive the car uh, of, of what we're actually trying to to do and more what's going to be successful um, and students are going to respond to um, because ultimately um, they, they have to uh, take this up uh, on mass for it for it to be um, successful. So um, that's something to think about. Um, but, uh, you know, I love dealing with the governance uh, issues, too. But I just I, I always say, let's take a few steps back and and see what we can, uh, we can kind of how we can engage this in uh, in real life. Um, IRL uh, and uh, and yeah, because I, I mean I love the, I love so many of these ideas. And so you know how 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 would it look like to just make this a project uh, to do this thing and do it in a democratic way, and then we can say okay, well we learn these lessons. That's going to inform how we incorporate, 
our bylaws. And this is way we made this decision didn't work or this approach didn't work. We need more membership engagement here. We need less here because it just is going to get bogged down. And then you can really start to say, okay, when we take a look at the bylaws, you know, a template or the questions that, that lead to the template, then we can then we can start making real decisions based on experience rather than just kind of like blue skying and saying, well, I kind of like this, I kind of like that. Um, so yeah, so, some thoughts there. Um, how has your engagement with the co-op community been so far? I'm, I'm curious. Uh, have you found it has been um, uh, helpful? Um, what do you think, you know, what do you think you need um, in terms of engagement from the co-op community? And how do you see that this uh, co-op as it, uh, because it's all about reciprocity, how do you see it as, it's, as it gets underway contributing back to the co-op community? Yeah, so last year we had some conversations with, yeah, YYC Growers and with uh, the Allium, which is a co-op, like a worker co-op restaurant in the city. And that was super helpful. Um, they shared some of their documents with us to help us create those. Um, and it was useful also to kind of see what pieces we were missing um, to engage with kind of an established co-op and see you know, all of the building blocks there and we're like, okay, well now we know what we need to collect. Um, I think moving forward, it, hopefully we can get, yeah, like our, raw, depending on, yeah, what kind of food we provide, but hopefully like raw materials from a food co-op or banking from a credit union and uh, yeah, have those relationships kind of built in. And we'd wanna be able to connect students as well to uh, ways that they can engage in the co-op model uh, outside of campus would also be um, a pretty good goal, I think, that you don't only have to engage in solidarity and mutuality as a student, which I think is so often the case. You can live the rest of your life like this. You can shop at a grocery co-op. You can live in a housing co-op. You can bank at a credit union. And um, all of that kind of infrastructure, you can participate in it. And yeah, you can build those spaces for yourself. I think one of the biggest ways that um, a food co-op established at the University of Calgary can give back to the co-op community is, um, I, so I can't speak to the specific uh, business uh, cooperation because we don't have that pinned down yet, um, but I, I think that having, you know, a place where uh, having at a university a board that must be filled by students and workers year in and year out will is a is a way to set up infrastructure and uh to constantly produce students and people who will then graduate and go out into the workforce who have cooperative governing board experience um an understanding of the model um very like real world and visceral understanding of how the model can benefit and i think you know like i think that can have an impact on some of the external challenges that we're facing that were mentioned uh, by michaela where you know we're going to people and we're talking about a food co-op and people don't know um but i think if we establish something that and and especially something that engages in such an intimate part of our humanity which is food it's integral to life there's something special about um building community and organizing around food that there's there's you know, like food will touch your culture, it will touch your health, it will touch your mental health. Um, it, it's about pleasure, it's about community. And I think, you know, there's, I, I think, I think cooperatives will go from, uh, in, in maybe the average student's mind, wait, what is that and how, how would that work to um, having a kind of like deep affection for it? And so, yeah, like, like Isabel saying, like, then you go out into the world and you, you're, living uh in an apartment building and you're like damn i wish this were democratically operated <laughs> like uh like that shawarma place <laughs> whose board i sat on you know in university or um you're at work and you're like damn you know the workers at uh at the shawarma place <laughs> had board seats and uh were unionized and um had a real like even seat at the table when it came to bargaining and everything um i'd like some of that here um you know, and, and then we start looking at work cooperatives. So I, I think, I think that that's a huge contribution. Plus, I, like every time, from from what I've seen, I know this is the case for me too. You know, you'll go to university, you don't know what you'll end up getting involved in, 
And then you find, you'll find a, a year or two later, oh my God, I'm so involved in this. I have a, a scary amount of knowledge that I didn't think that I would have on these like very niche particular subjects. Um, and some people will be interested in the, in cooperatives on campus to that extent by get, by virtue of getting involved and getting exposed. And then I, I think that the, the, they're very likely to then go on and say, oh, there, there's an entire world. Like uh, if the food co-op is, as I, I think it should be a member of a federation or of the many federations that co-ops have or associations say, oh my God, there's an entire cooperative ecosystem. And then their imagination runs wild even further. So that, that, that's, that's what I think about. Because I think, Everything should be cooperative, cooperativized personally. So, just one step, one step in getting there. That's great, and I'm glad you. I'm so glad you touched on that, and and, and that I think, in terms of the broader cooperative community, um, is an absolutely essential um, and um, immeasurable um, contribution that 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 needs to be developed um and and needs uh and needs kind of all hands on deck i think to to facilitate that um we need another we need a new generation of cooperators um it's very clear uh in western canada that we have a very incredibly strong history and legacy um and cooperative foundation but that that has uh atrophied um and uh, that's gonna sound challenging um and it's um, and it's it partially intended to, but not in the way of 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 being um, uh, critical of the of the movement, but just to highlight a, uh, what I think is a reality um, that um, that this that this incredibly strong foundation needs to be reinforced um, and needs to be revitalized and um, and brought into the 21st century. And and to to if if we're going to meet the challenges of the 21st century, just as a society, much less a movement. Um, so I, I think that these practical um, experiences on campus are, are you know, the, probably the best way to learn, you know, because we can go do a bunch of PowerPoints to, to students on cooperation and the seven cooperative principles. But until you see it in action, until you're engaged in hard conversations and debates on the board or, or with members, um, trying to get your head around what the truth of a good decision uh, is in the best interest of the co-op, um, and for and for the stakeholders in the community, then you, you haven't really experienced um, both the both the challenge and 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 the reward of uh, of direct democracy. Um, and we talk a lot of de about democracy uh, without ever practicing it in our society. And so here's here's such a great opportunity to develop that where where the rubber hits the road, so to speak, where it's really meaningful and as you say, integral to life, uh, which is what food is um and 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 is the basis of of community um right somebody said you know we're only three three days away you know we're th we're three missed meals away from uh <laughs> from uh riots uh, or or social collapse at any given time so th this is it couldn't be more important uh and and a better starting place for uh um for cooperation uh, greater cooperation on campus and and, and, dem and democratic involvement of students um I don't know, uh, Isabel. Would you like to build on that uh, in your experience in in in, in the co in, in the co-op movement so far, um, um, and kind of see pull pull the threads together on, on on where you see kind of where you envision the next five years, um, and Michaela obviously as well. Um, where 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 can we go uh, as a movement, and and regardless of whether we end up doing shawarma or we're doing other other things, kind of what where do you uh, where do you see the, the potential of this going? I think that in it, like, was well, one of the small pieces that, you know, is a benefit to students in addition to, you know, getting food <laughs> and eating <laughs> is that they kind of will build, be able to learn about cooperatives and they can sit on the board and they can have this kind of governance experience in a way that is so rare on campuses. Um, and moving forward, kind of like we're saying, those people will bring those skills into the spaces that they go into and they will transform the spaces that they enter. And that will have, I think, a really positive ripple effect. And like we were saying earlier, like it's difficult with this development because yeah, the student population is transitory, but that also means that students will be coming out of school every single year 
with this knowledge and with this experience. Uh, I think that's a really, you know, it's the, uh, the other side of the coin that that transitory population just means more people who have this experience. Um, in terms of, you know, relationships with other co-ops and I guess like the co-op sector moving forward, I think, yeah, I think we, that's true. There is a really strong history of co-ops in Western Canada, in Alberta, a long history of solidarity, of workers' unions, of really strong kind of social solidarity in a way that's been lost. Um, and I think that it is kind of incumbent on the co-op sector to kind of revitalize their own history and start showing up for people who they might not have thought of as being part of their community to think about who, who am I not seeing in this boardroom? Who am I not seeing in this meeting? Whose experiences are we not talking about? And doing our best to include those voices, I think is the way we have to move forward because we can't leave anybody behind. And uh, you know, we're only as strong as our weakest link, so. Um, for me, the one thing that I think about a lot is that when you hear people talking about students or younger people whatever that might be depending on the context like there's this kind of expectation of real apathy that you know we aren't we're not doing anything there's not a lot of young people going into the cooperative movement or engaging in organizing or activism in other capacities and I think that for me like one of the things that is so valuable about really developing a democratic community like this is to really make students realize the level of power that they have when they work together on a project that is important. And I think that going off of what we've been all talking about, like that's going to start with students because I think students really feel powerless to the university, to the provincial government, to the federal government, to their parents. It's this kind of odd position in life where not quite a kid, not quite an adult. And I think that once they leave the university, if we've shown them that they do in fact have power to make positive change in their small university community, then they can go and do that in a very different capacity, but that will show that like, oh, I have power to reach out to community members and make positive change. And I think that that's so important. And that's something that I think we've forgotten, but like there is, students aren't apathetic they are tired and they're very frustrated and they don't know the way to act on their anger and their frustrations and their desire to make change. And if we give them avenues and show them how we can do that, then I think like we can take over the world. <laughs> yeah, I just wanna, I wanna touch on that uh, and something that we haven't mentioned as explicitly. Uh, and one of the co-op principles and one of the pillars of cooperativism is autonomy. Uh, and that's often glossed over in terms of, you know, what makes cooperatives distinct and, and why you see co-ops in, in, in various communities of all political stripes, but in, especially in some of the communities that you think of as being the most conservative and antithetical to cooperativism are some of the strongest cooperating communities. And it's because that value of autonomy, they understand that the only way to achieve it is through solidarity. Um, because if, because united, they are very strong, uh, but divided, then they're incredibly dependent uh, on whoever the, uh, the, the external big player is, right? So the way that you build autonomy is through solidarity. Um, and when students learn that in a practical sense, or anybody learns that, that is incredibly empowering. Now, it takes a lot of organization. It takes a lot of um, skill um, in persuasion um, and in and democratic politics. And those need to be developed. And those have atrophied in, our, in various ways in our society um, so that there's no real process where I can learn this on the ground and, and develop those skills and go enter into politics in a way where I've already represented the interests of my community. And, and we've already dealt with a bunch of these issues that are so integral to, uh, to our, our, sh our shared life and society but people getting parachuted in instead, not really knowing how to make decisions or not knowing that they have the potentially, they have the communities behind them to, to make in decisions in the best interest of those communities. Um, 
So I, I absolutely agree. And I want to just emphasize that or when Matush mentioned, you know, when you move out and you're in an apartment building and you're a bunch of renters that are, are potentially being exploited uh, or, or, you know, immiserated by the fact that you don't really have many rights uh, regarding property and, and, you, and, your, and your living arrangement is insecure, um, that you could actually, you know, put your money together potentially and, and buy a property or or become involved in a housing co-op in a different way or that the fact that that's even a model that exists um that could be empowering that you could think towards in terms of strategizing how we um become more secure in our housing arrangements um and it's not easy because real estate is exceptionally uh inflated in value and you know another reason why to you know we have this narrative as you say um that students are apathetic, uh, that this younger generation doesn't want to work, um, that, um, you know, they're too entitled um, and uh, it's too, everything's too comfortable. Um, and my response to that is when you have a unifying cultural myth and narrative that is, you know, yeah, you're going to have to suffer and struggle and everything like that. But you, at the end of the rainbow, there's this, um, you know, piece of property that you're going to, you're going to get your, you know, your house in the suburbs, um, you're going to get your car debt free. Um, you're going to have um, a, a great retirement at 65 uh, and full benefits and uh, and a secure employment arrangement until then. Um, those that's the narrative. And when that starts to erode, when people look around them and they say, "Well, I don't, I don't, I can't see that for myself." Do you see that for you? You and and everybody you look around and says, "No, nope, I'm not experiencing that. I don't see a clear path towards that." And I don't really have many examples in my life other than people that are, are you know, a couple generations older than me that are telling me to pull my bootstraps where there's actually so, that kind of success anymore, right? So it's a new reality. And it's incredibly, incredibly um, depressing um, and disincentivizing when that, when that collapses for people. But so, so that's, you know, a new reality that we can get into the existential angst of that. And that could unpack that over a number of hours, I'm sure. Um, but, but cooperativism I see is, is, is so hopeful and optimistic because even within that reality, as, as much as we may be dealing with um, a standard of living that is not the same as it was in the sixties uh, in the Western world, it's a reality that we're having to grapple with. And there's a lot of cognitive dissonance. Um, through cooperativism, we still can have autonomy, we can still have dignity in our lives, um, and we can still have um, a strong role uh, in, in governing our communities um, and, 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 and carving a path uh, forward that's not at uh, the behest of, of you know, the huge, uh, the plutocracy, let's say. Um, so yeah, just, just to get a little bit more philosophical on that point, but, but you know, to, to unpack and explicate that, I think it's part of the the conversation that we can have going forward, and that students, um, you know, may be very interested in um, how this touches on on that. It's a it's a it's a it's a start, right? Um, I wanted to make what, uh, one more comment on like the future of the cooperative movement. I think like from from my understanding, all the energy. From from my reading of the history of the co-op movement, a lot of that energy and passion um, uh, in in the start uh, of the cooperative movement came from you know poor farmers, um, the the urban poor, etc. You know, kind of um, when they organized themselves and when they talked to each other, there was a there was both the hatred of their conditions and a and a like a a contempt for domination over them by the the ruling institutions, banks, um, big corporations, railroads, the government, et cetera. And then at the same time, there was like an incredible and powerful love and solidarity that they used as a, as a glue that brought them together to then form those institutions. And I think like the, for the cooperative movement in the future, it's about like, and this, the, this is building on like what Isabel is saying around like, you know who's not in the boardroom like who are who are the the like poor and downtrodden like i'm trying to uh use the the biblical phrase you know that's been uh that's been used is, is who, who are the poor, poor and downtrodden today you know it's often immigrant refugee populations raci racialized also the rural poor as well 
Um, and the demographics may have shifted and it, it may be that that the constituents who um, formed the now very large and robust consumer cooperatives and credit unions, now maybe they're doing okay because after all those generations, they used cooperatives and now, and now like it helped build generational wealth. Now it's about, for me, looking at the populations who didn't have that opportunity and how the cooperative movement can use that established generational wealth that they helped build to then um, offer a ramp or offer the experience and expertise and capital to the next generation of the people trying to do the same thing. Um, also, I think strong solidarity within the cooperative movement and recognizing that, you know, in, the, in those populations, a lot of them are concentrated in that the low wage urban uh, working environment. And um, for a lot of them, there are major workplace issues. And that means solidarity with labor unions. And also, uh, I, I personally feel very strongly about a very strong focus on worker cooperatives and multi-stakeholder worker cooperatives, um, because those are the areas where like workers just don't have capital by rule, you know, uh, as a whole. So I, I think like the, the large, robust consumer cooperatives and credit unions have a huge role to play in bolstering um, the capacity of the worker cooperative movement. And I think from there, you'll see the giving back will be all the, the you know, poor immigrant refugees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, disabled folks who are, who are, who will be uplifted by robust worker cooperatives and multi-stakeholder cooperatives, then we'll say, well, now I want to start my cooperative grocery store. <laughs> um, I want to start my, my cooperative um, ethnic grocery market or whatever. Um, and then you'll start to see that feedback again. Um, and they'll have a lot more capital to put into their credit unions, their local credit unions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, hmm. yeah. yeah, and I, I was on a campus where students had been fighting really hard for a long time and there were things that they had won for me and students that I will never meet whose names I will never know fought really hard for me to have a better experience than they did and for me to come to this campus and be able to work towards creating spaces that will allow people to be in solidarity with each other that's really powerful for me and like I can be fulfilled in doing this work, even though it's hard and there's like so many obstacles in our path, knowing that there's gonna be a student who for them, this will be formative and impactful for them. And they will probably never know who I am and that's fine. Um, but it's, it's yeah, like Mateusz is saying, like this deep love for each other. Um, I know the power that students have and the power that they have used to make my experience better. And I know that when students are <laughs> when students are united, we are powerful, and um, that I think for me, I guess, is like a big driver is that love for students and the love for the way that we show up for each other and that we can show up for each other. Well, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful conversation. Um, is there any? Uh, but at this point, we should probably. Uh, wrap it up with uh, with an invitation and I want to invite all three of you um, and, um, and anybody who's interested to the gathering uh, which is the cooperative movement in Alberta coming together uh, after a much much delayed period of time um, due to unfortunate realities obviously over the last year and a half um, uh, to have these kind of conversations exactly these kind of conversations um, and and to meet uh, to actually meet uh, co-op leaders across the board. So um, I'd like to invite you. That's October twenty sixth to twenty eighth, and in Edmonton. Uh, but I think it's important that uh, that that we hear your voices um, and the voices of the next generation in, in these exactly these kinds of meetings. Um, so let's talk about that. Um, obviously, on this conversation, we'll have, we'll have some kind of link or some kind of information to to that um, the gathering for. Um, for members of ACCA, BCCA, um, whoever else is interested and has the opportunity to attend. Um, so yeah, I really wanna thank you for that. That was a really inspiring conversation. I'm really excited about the future of this um, and, uh, and looking forward to contributing whatever I can um, to help out. So 
Um, uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation as we go. Thank you so much for having us. This was wonderful.